Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be on site. So uh, hopefully in another time, I'll, I'll be happy to, to meet all of you in, in person. As uh, <clears throat> Roger said already, I mean, uh, I'm uh, at Divinity. Divinity is a Swiss foundation. So we are, uh, have an office in, in Zurich. Uh, we also have offices in, in San Francisco, Palo Alto and, and Tokyo. Plus a few people all over the world. So we're about a hundred twenty people uh, right now. Uh, most of them software engineers and, and uh, researchers. Uh, many of them cryptography researchers. And it does sort of my story how I got into the field. I'm, I'm a cryptographer, but then uh, the the crypto valley came up, and uh, sort of uh, suddenly when, when people. Uh, when you, you tell people that you, you, you're in crypto, then I guess they sort of thought, okay, you're, you're one of those uh, guys who makes a lot of money in the Silicon Valley or in the crypto valley. Uh, and uh, so I, guess I got interested myself to see, see what this is. And uh, uh, when I learned the, the vision of the internet computer, I was like e eager to join that and, and to build the internet computer. And so the, therefore today I would like to tell you more about the internet computer, uh, what it is, uh, also a bit about the, well, not tension, but the, <laughs> the difference between crypto and cryptography, or actually it's, it's maybe one and the same uh, after all. Uh, I'm looking forward to the times when uh, newspapers write about uh, crypto technology, they actually don't mean uh, tokens, but they actually mean, mean much more by it than uh, hopefully one day the, the internet computer. So the internet computer is, is uh, I mean, it's, it's a protocol that we're building that runs on, on, the, on, the, on the internet. And in some sense, it's, it's the evolution of the internet. And actually, I mean, what I'm going to tell today is uh, in some sense, just a glimpse of uh, what we're doing of the technology. And we're launching uh, our sodium release tomorrow, and uh, we'll have a lot of uh, technical talks about some of the details uh, that I'm just going to mention in, in passing today. So I'll encourage you to uh, register to that event and, and join it. It's an online event, event for about four hours. And just go to the definity.org website, and, and, and you'll find all the links uh, how to participate. So let's see. Exactly. So here, here let's, let's first uh, sort of discuss what we are trying to replace uh, with uh, the internet computer. So today, when you build applications, well, so you might think you build them actually on the internet, like everything is a, is a web application, but it's, it's not true. So the internet uh, only provides the, the basic connectivity so the, uh, via TCP and IP, which is an open protocol, but all the rest of it really is um, uh, proprietary uh, technology. So when you build an application, you use cloud services, you use some, some web servers, uh, you use databases, uh, and then in order to make it secure, then also you, you have to attach some firewalls and, and so on. And you end up with a very complex uh, system. And I mean, this complexity has a number of, of drawbacks. So first of all, it is inherently insecure because it becomes very hard to manage. And we hear daily in the newspapers about the uh, incidents if some passwords were stolen, personal data was lost, some websites got hacked. So really it's, it's insecure, the, the current stack that we have. And also like just uh, deploying a simple application becomes very complex. You have to deal with a lot of, uh, a lot of things. So the life of developer uh, is still very complex. And then because the whole stack is uh, proprietary, it's controlled by big tech like Amazon, Apple, Google, et cetera, et cetera. It's sort of locked in, in, in into their uh, ecosystem and sort of you're sort of committed into that. And if they change the, their interfaces, uh, you're sort of bound to change it as well and, and uh, you cannot do much about that. And of course, this drives up costs quite enormously. enormously and, and if you think about it, uh, 3.9 trillion is the IT cost like uh, last year, and that's a tremendous cost. Uh, so there's a lot of money to be saved there if we could simplify that. And that's really our, our goal to simplify this whole stack to, to make uh, life for developers easier and also more decentralized and so that people are not depending on, on big tech. 
and really this big big tech dependency so it's, it's not only that they monopol monopolize the, the whole stack that, that you have to um, buy into their, their services uh, but it's much worse than that because they control all the data so if you uh, write an application today you probably are going to use some of the but just for login, you're probably going to use either Google, uh, Facebook, or, or Apple logins. So already there, you, you buy into their ecosystem. Uh, but also, you're depending on all the data that they have about users and, and uh, how to manage those data. Uh, even worse, so the interface they pro provide, how, how the web works today, I mean, the web or the web browser was meant to be like the interfaces to, to those applications, so the web that would allow you to, to use the, the internet, but now it's, it's really just like, like a thin front end piece to all the back end uh, uh, services that are controlled by big tech. And they control the interfaces uh, of these things and, and really hampers innovation by that. So I guess many think it's, it's time uh, for a reboot here and, and blockchain really is at the forefront of, of this uh, uh, what we consider is really an evolution of the internet. So, uh, I mean, the, the internet sort of started out as a, a, a hookup with TCP IP out of the DARPANET, and then, then the World Wide Web uh, came, added some more functionality on top of that. And uh, <clears throat> now, the, uh, what we want to build is uh, the internet as a computer. So that as, as, be, as now we have it already, that the internet, uh, the IP protocol, uh, provides the connectivity, it hooks up different servers, it allows actually to, to build the applications uh, as we do, the, do them uh, today, but with hooking up the different services. But we, we want to take it to, to the next level where actually the internet itself is the computer, it can easily host applications onto the internet, so the internet sort of natively powers everything. So it's just very easy, you run your, uh, your code on the internet without having to worry about security or scalability or, or any of those nuisances that, that you have to deal with today. And this is enabled by the Internet Computer Protocol, so very similar to what TCP IP does uh, uh, for the Internet con connectivity. The Internet Computer Protocol that, that we are uh, we have invented that on our building is sort of enabling the Internet uh, computer. So it hooks up together a number of data centers um, that then together can provide uh, this functionality. So let me uh, explain a bit more about the internet computer, how it works. Again, I can, can really just barely scratch the surface here uh, and give you some, some high level ideas about that. Uh, so please join us uh, tomorrow for uh, more details. So the internet computer is, uh, I mean, like a blockchain uh, uh, or a new kind of blockchain really that uh, aims to replace the, the complete legacy stack. And it's sort of different from, from uh, on, on other blockchain computers like, or other blockchain projects where uh, the functionality there is, is provided uh, like, uh, sort of by, by dedicated either like proof of stake that, that consu consumes a, a lot of uh, protocols or, or uh, a lot of, sorry, a lot of power. So proof of work or proof of, of, of stake. So here it's, it's different. We, we have like dedicated data centers that uh, just use their computational power not to mine, uh, mine Bitcoin or something like that, but actually to, uh, to run uh, the software on top of, uh, of the internet uh, protocol. So that actually you run your applications and you don't waste any resources uh, for some side effects that really don't make a lot of sense. So the, <clears throat> the Internet Computer Protocol is, is the protocol that uh, allows these uh, independent data centers uh, to jointly perform these computational tasks. And so the idea here is really that, that you sort of distribute by, by the protocol uh, the, the software onto the different data centers. Uh, you replicate them so, so that at the end of the day, uh, the code can be securely uh, executed and <clears throat> it is unstoppable and, and is secure. And of course, for, for all of that, you need a lot of cryptography to make that secure. You need the distributed uh, cryptographic protocols that will uh, bind these uh, different pieces uh, together and, and make sure that everything is secure and, and correct. 
<clears throat> and well, it gets, it, it's not only uh, enough to uh, build a lot of uh, cryptographic protocols to distribute these computational powers, but actually also need to make uh, or reinvent software to make uh, the life of developers uh, way easier. And in some sense, the way we, we see uh, software on the internet computer, it, it's also an evolution of, of smart contracts. And so we, we think that software should really be like something like a software canister, which is uh, a piece of web assembly code. So you, you have to sandbox uh, these uh, pieces, of course. So that's why, where web assembly comes in. And, and some memory pages around that. But when you program that, actually, you, you don't have to worry about the, you know, storage or, or databases. It, it's sort of built in natively, magically. Just pro write your program, use some variables, and upload it to the internet computer, and it just runs there. And the idea, of course, is then that users can uh, interact with this um, uh, with these pieces of, of software, and actually they also can interact with each other. So you, when you write an application, you, you can uh, use any of the other applications that are already running on the internet computers. So it's like an open, decentralized uh, software um, ecosystem, really. And the beauty of that is uh, because it, it's now running uh, governed by, by by a protocol, it is tamper-proof and unstoppable uh, by default. So the protocol just makes sure that it runs forever, uh, the results cannot be cheated, uh, nobody can, can tamper with, uh, with these uh, canisters. And also scalability and the parallelizability is, is already built in. So if, if your, uh, your computer program, your canister requires more resources, the system automatically provides you these resources it, it will scale, scale out uh, your your data if you need more storage. It will scale out your computational power if you need more power. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the whole system is very efficient. So, so we do reach uh, speeds that are comparable to like uh, cloud applications. And I think the uh, what probably cannot be stressed enough is that the, the whole system is, is open and interoperable. So you do not you get not locked into to any vendor because because these canisters, once they are deployed on the internet uh, computer, they are sort of there uh, for, forever. So they cannot uh, just change, or at least you can have an open governance system such that, that the changes to interfaces of these canisters can only be, be done if, uh, if the protocol agrees or the decentralized governance of, this, uh, of the internet computer agrees that this interface now should be changed. So it, it's a... Uh, an open decentralized uh, way to do computations. And so that's uh, actually also I think, a big part of the evolution. And that's where cryptography is also key to enable uh, these features. And we can really build anything on the internet computer. So you can build a website. So it just uh, a canister can directly talk, deliver code into a browser. So you, uh, your browser can connect to uh, a canister. So it's very easy to deploy a website. And like I said, I show a screenshot later of, of a sort of a linked up, we call it like a LinkedIn alternative uh, that, that we, we, we build. And, uh, and you can actually also download the code. You know, let me talk about that uh, a little later, uh, how, how you can really uh, deploy things. But the point here is it's very easy to, to write uh, like a, a website, just a, sim a single, simple, simple single canister that, that you can upload. Um, open internet services. So anyone then, uh, so if there was something like a linked up uh, or linked in version as a canister there, anybody who then wants uh, to make use of that data that, that uh, this canister provides can just do that and it's just there forever. So it's not like uh, in, in the uh, current situation where, where LinkedIn can just change their APIs and then, then uh, sort of you're out of business because uh, uh, you were using their a a APIs and they, they changed, just changed that. So on the, on the uh, internet computer, this can no longer happen. You can also build enterprise systems, actually can you hook up multi uh, enterprise systems. Uh, it's really just a, a development environment where you can easily um, uh, build uh, different libraries and, and uh, deploy them and, and hook them together. So something like, like uh, you know, the typical blockchain uh, application where you want to say, say they have like this, um, uh, the delivery chain, you, you want to monitor where goods go and so on. It can easily be done because now you, you don't have to agree on, on any platform. It's just there and, and anybody um, contributing to, to like a delivery chain uh, can just uh, deploy their, their own canister and they can all work together on the internet computer. 
Now, as you can also do all, all kind of DeFi applications or anything where, where uh, you, you care about decentralized systems, uh, it's just uh, a very straightforward way to deploy that. And in some sense, uh, the engine computer is really, the, uh, we think, the rocket fuel for developers and uh, will bring a tremendous value to developers and uh, application providers, users, and enterprises alike. And in order to uh, build a, a canister, and you can actually try that yourself, I mean, uh, so you, you can, uh, we'll, we'll open up the, the network uh, later this year to the general public. Uh, right now, you, you can uh, apply as a developer and actually run your own code uh, and, and try it out. So I also invite you and encourage you to do that. Now, if you want to do that, uh, in principle, you can write an application in any language that, that you then compile to WebAssembly, and then the WebAssembly code uh, is formed into a canister that is then uploaded uh, to the internet computer via the internet uh, computer protocol. Now, uh, of course, uh, there, there's a, an SDK for, for, for doing that. And, and right now, Definity has SDKs for, for Rust, Motoko, and, and, and C. And if you write uh, your program in any of these languages, you really just write, write that in, in uh, the SDK editor, uh, press some buttons, and uh, it will be automatically deployed onto the internet computer. Now, Motoko is a, a language that we have developed uh, ourselves, actually by, by the, the same guys who uh, were involved with WebAssembly. And, and so the, the aim of Motoko is, is to make it easier to program a distributed system so where, where you have, uh, uh, you, you have like units, like these canisters that, that uh, asynchronous, asynchronously communicate with each other. And, and so Motoko sort of abstracts the, that away and makes it very easy to uh, to deal with this uh, asynchronous calls and uh, distributed systems. And really, really I can also not stress this enough. So now you can actually build code on the internet. You don't have to rely on cloud services, web services. Uh, you don't need any databases. It's it's all based, built in automatically. You just have variables and uh, and, and, you, and that's that's all you need. Uh, load balancing, it's all also built in. The internet computer automatically assigns as much uh, resources than you, than you need, or as you need. Uh, content distribution, it's also built in because it is a, a distributed protocol. Uh, so there will always be a, a version of your data next uh, to you. So it, uh, it's, it's re really fast and to deliver that data to, to users. You don't need any, like all of the security features, firewalls, um, passwords, antivirus, all of that is, is of the past. It's really, really simple, greatly uh, reduces the complexity of deploying protocols or deploying um, applications on the, on the internet and building them. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned that already back in January, actually up in Davos. We, we, we demonstrated the first uh, application on, on the internet computer, which uh, we called linked up. And it just consisted of two canisters. There was a backend canister that would manage all the user profiles. And there was a front end, ca front -end canister th that uh, served uh, the, the web uh, uh, content uh, in, into the browsers. And so, this also is an example of autonomous software because this backend canister that stored all the user profiles that uh, was programmed as a canister that's independent, so that it's not owned by anybody but governed by the internet computer, and so uh, that means then everybody can actually use uh, that, that data or build their own their own programs that uh, can can make use of the data without risking the APIs to being being changed. And, and so there, of course, also the you know, crypto or the tokenized governance uh, come in, in, into play. Uh, so as it is a, a blockchain uh, uh, computer at the end of the day. Uh, the blockchain and, and tokens help you to, to make sure that the, the, these autonomous canisters are, are governed and it sort of the, the, whole, the whole system uh, together determines how, uh, how the system should evolve. Uh, sorry, um, going wrong direction here. Um, as I said, there's a lot of cryptography that's underneath the, the internet computer protocol, and, and therefore by the internet computer. And uh, sort of 
to many people, when you, you tell them, uh, I, I'm encrypted, they really think about bl blockchain and, the, and they think the world sort of started, uh, I guess, in, in, in 2013 with uh, the uh, Nakamoto paper, uh, or maybe even later but when Bitcoin was actually uh, very, very valuable and, and everybody got interested, oh, it's Bitcoin, oh, it's a cryptocurrency. So crypto today sort of means this Bitcoin thing. Uh, but I mean, as you all know, cryptography is, is much older. And well, it, it already was first used by, by Caesar. By then, really just to, to encrypt uh, stuff. So uh, secrecy and encryption was the first use. And then it took quite a while until people realized there, there is much more there. Uh, that you can also do like, like signatures, so you can authenticate messages over uh, digital communication. I mean, I guess you can also authenticate them via letter, but it's, it's more useful if you have uh, digital communication. So, uh, so in the uh, last century, uh, 76, uh, Diffie and Hellman made a digital signature and sort of showed you, you can encrypt, but you can also know uh, from whom you get a message and nobody else can, can read that message. And the next uh, thing when, when like, it strikes my mind or comes to mind when people say crypto is really the, the crypto conference in, in Santa Barbara that is held annually there. Well, actually, actually, I guess this year it was held virtually for the first time, but usually it's in, in Santa Barbara. The first time it was in 81 and sort of that changed where, where cryptography became a science and in some sense that's uh, uh, the, the foundation of, of uh, or like start to lay the foundation of the internet computer where, where people came together and, and uh, uh, were interested in, in, in cryptography and were interested to figure out what, what, what you could all do with that. And well, briefly thereafter, uh, Andrew Yoho, Yoho showed that, uh, well, cryptography is really uh, more than just encryption signature, but actually when, when two parties come together, they can compute any function whatsoever on, on the party's input. So if there's two parties, one holds X and Y, and X1 and the other one holds X2, they run a protocol such at the end of the day, they will learn any function on, on, on X and, and uh, X1 and X2 without learning th these values themselves. They just learn the result, nothing else. So he sort of, uh, the first example he gave was the millionaire's problem where two people want to figure out who is richer. In this case, uh, they can do that with this protocol. They just learn a single bit whether you or, or I are richer, but, but none of the parties learn uh, the salary of, of each other or, or the wealth of each other. Another interesting development, and I think now we're, we're getting the, the seed of, of, of Bitcoin in some sense was in, in, in 85, where David Chaum sort of realized that actually cryptography not only should be used for, for the government, for, for the military, but actually it's much, much more powerful for, for protecting privacy, for protecting citizens themselves. And, and so he uh, had a number of protocols that, that uh, would allow people to communicate uh, amongst each other or without the, the, um, the identities of these people being, being revolved. So for instance, uh, he had a scheme where, where he could get an identity card for, from the government and later on go walk up to some bar and, and show that, that, that you're older than 18 without revealing your name or, or your age or, or your identity or any other information that could identify yourself. And I think that that really laid the, the seed for, for the, the cyberpunk uh, development and uh, particularly for, for eCash. So the, an eCash was another example that, that David Cham came up with. And, as we, uh, and sort of the, the cyberpunks were really fascinated about that, especially in the US where we're talking about the government is, is bad and actually the David Cham's paper was called uh, uh, Getting Rid of Big Brother and that, that really appealed to them. Uh, but before uh, we, we, we get to Bitcoin, uh, the next the milestone was, was uh, by uh, Goldwasser, Goldwasser, Macaulay and Victorson, who actually showed that, that you can uh, compute any function in, in a secure way as long as sort of, like, there's n parties. So it's generation of what, what, uh, what you are for two parties. So if there's n parties, the majority of them are, are honest or are not corrupt. corrupt and then you can still compute uh, any function in a secure way. And that's in, in some sense really the foundation now for, for what we do at Definity with the internet computer. It's a distributed protocol over, over these data centers. And as long as the majority of these data centers uh, are not uh, uh, misbehaving, I mean, even exactly, if, as long as the majority of the data centers are not be misbehaving, so uh, some a small subset 
uh, up to one third can actually misbehave and cheat as, as they want. They still cannot uh, tamper with the internet computer. And so that's really the, the basis here. Now, of course, all, all of these protocols, I mean, were uh, so far, I mean, up to 86, uh, the encryption signature were, were fast, but all, all the rest were more of theoretical interest and theoretical solutions. You, you could never really uh, build a fast protocol, uh, build an internet computer with uh, what they had back then. And <clears throat> right, so here, here's Bitcoin. And the, what, what is interesting here, uh, from my perspective, it, it's not that, that they had like a, like a, a new protocol that would sort of uh, distributedly, distributedly allow you to maintain a ledger, because that was just like a very simple special special case of the the protocol by uh, Goldwasser, Bicoli, Victorson. Really, just like a number of parties come together, they, they want to uh, compute this this ledger functionality. Uh, I mean, that that was well known. Not, nothing new there. Uh, the revolution was that uh, they made that in such a way that you don't have to identify the parties who participate in this protocol. Because any of the, the protocols so far were sort of uh, heavily re relying on the fact that the number of dedicated parties come, come together and they agree to run this protocol and, and then thereby then they, they can guarantee the correctness of the protocol. Now, uh, that of course requires some, some kind of public key infrastructure. It, it's a, a centralized uh, system uh, again, and so that never worked. When I mean, people tried uh, uh, since like uh, early 2000, uh, these protocols were like distributed protocols were around. It was also clear that that's a way to secure uh, secure information, but it, it never really took off. And I think the reason really is because it was just too hard uh, to get uh, convince uh, I guess the public. Uh, that it may make sense uh, for a number of parties jointly to, to run this thing. And Bitcoin really changed that, right? So that their protocol, you don't have to have an identity. It's just whoever has enough computational power can, can contribute to, to the protocol. And so that's like the pro and cons here, right? I mean, uh, on the one hand, uh, if you would just allow anybody to participate, then of course, everybody could just make a million identities and then become the majority because uh, as said before, in, in the, the protocol uh, that uh, GMW presented, I mean, the majority sort of decides uh, about what the outcome of the system here is. And if you don't have like a way to identify the parties who participate, then of course everybody uh, could just join here and, and, and try, try to change uh, the outcome here. And that's what, what Bitcoin did. So that's why this is a proof of work protocol where you have to heavily invest. So it's not possible that, that you can easily just come up with multiple identities. Uh, and sort of participate uh, in multiple times in the protocol. Now, of course, the, the drawback of the, that is <laughs> now you have to have a huge data center uh, to, to uh, participate here. And uh, well, but, but still Bitcoin is very valuable. I think it, it also starts to de destroy our planet. It's just uh, like uh, a pure, uh, uh, very poor use of, uh, of resources. Um, but along that, I guess uh, Bitcoin was just about uh, uh, was about maintaining a, a ledger, so very specific uh, functionality. Uh, uh, just a few years after Bitcoin uh, <coughs> uh, and, and uh, uh, Buterin uh, sort of realized that actually uh, instead of just doing uh, uh, maintaining a ledger, you could just do any computation. Well, big surprise, right? I mean, <laughs> GMW already showed that you can do any computa computation, but just, I mean, uh, nevertheless, it, it gets to, to the world, this was a big change because the world has already thought, oh, Bitcoin is very cool, so we, uh, we can have money in a distributed decentralized uh, way. Uh, here with, with Ethereum, introducing the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, people actually realized, well, actually having a decentralized computer that is not controlled by anybody is really valuable, right? So we can do so much more things. And I think in some sense that also laid the foundation uh, or it did lay the foundation for the crypto value and, and, and also like to the internet computer, what, what, what would we want to build? And uh, right, I mean, I guess here the next step is really that, that uh, we have like a generic computer that, that is run by, by, by powerful uh, data centers and together can uh, provide this uh, functionality that was uh, talking a lot about uh, before. 
Now let's just have a, a, a peek, a small peek under the hood. And again, we will uh, explain much more about the, the protocols and the technology about that tomorrow in our launch event. Uh, so the internet computer has really has like four protocol layers. So uh, underneath the internet computer or, or the internet computer protocol is run on top of the, the, of the public internet. So in some sense, it's, it's or in every sense, it's a very hostile environment. So you have to use a lot of cryptography to, to make sure that this all is secure. And the, the layers are, but first you have like, like a peer-to-peer -peer layer where, where the, just make sure that, that the, the different data centers can communicate with each other, that they can ex exchange the data, they can exchange, uh, you know, like agree on, on which, uh, uh, which, um, <clears throat> executions uh, to, to take uh, to take next so in, in that sense it's, it's really like a, like a normal computer but where you have sort of a cpu and that executes one step after the other it's just here that the, the cpu is replicated across a number of data centers and so they have to agree on which uh, which executions to uh, execute in which order because otherwise uh, the results will be different on all of these and that is done with the consensus protocol so once the, the uh, everybody has the, the pool of messages that they, they want to potentially execute the consensus orders them and make sure that they all agree which uh, steps to take next and then on top of that is like a message routing layer because now if, if we have these canisters and they want to talk to each other you need, need to make sure that this is enabled and, and that is is done by by the message routing layer so it uh, not only uh, sort of routes the messages to, that the canisters will want to execute uh, to these canisters but it also routes messages between uh, these canisters so that they can execute them and there's, I mean, as I mentioned, there's a lot of crypto here. So there, there is a, a random beacon, which is a distributed cryptographic protocol to come up with a, uh, a random value so, so that nobody else, uh, so the, the random, the value is, true, is truly random uh, as, as long as, uh, again, the, the majority of the participants are behaving according to the protocol. And as long as this is the case, the value is uh, truly random. Or I guess pseudo random because it's, it's a cryptographic protocol. So in order to do that, uh, we, we need a distributed key generation uh, a protocol. So the, for this random beacon protocol, everybody has their own secret keys that, that, that they, they use in order to participate in the protocol. And those keys, of course, need, need to be uh, generated in a trustworthy way. And so that's why we need a distributed uh, key generation protocol. And again, th th this was because all of these protocols are really uh, tailored for the uh, internet computer. And that's uh, I guess why I'm also so excited about this project because there's a lot of new cryptographic protocols that we are uh, inventing and have invented uh, to build this uh, computer. A threshold signatures. So, so the, in order to have consensus, uh, we, we use threshold signatures, so the different messages get signed by, by all the nodes, and as, as long as soon as uh, uh, a majority of them or two thirds of them have signed a message, to, then we know because that that is the next message uh, to execute. Well, more, more or less, but actually it's a bit more. It's so actually a two-stage uh, consensus protocol uh, that, that we are, are, are using in order to to reach that consensus. Another example is something we call stream signature. So as uh, the different uh, canisters uh, exchange messages. Of course, these messages are, I mean, all the canisters are not executed on, on, all, the, uh, on all the nodes and all the uh, data centers. So we, we need, of course, to, to load balance that, otherwise it wouldn't scale. And so that, that means you now have different subsets of uh, data centers that jointly uh, execute uh, uh, different uh, canisters. And in order for, for these uh, subsets to communicate with each other, of course, they, they now need to authenticate uh, the, the different messages. And these messages are really streams of messages between uh, the different subset of data centers. And in order to facilitate that, uh, you need something that we call stream signature, but it's like a new kind of signature scheme uh, because this is jointly signing is, is, is very expensive. So you want to just sign a, uh, as, as little as possible, and then sort of you build in the different streams that go to the different uh, uh, different canisters, the different subsets of, of the data centers. You sort of sign all, all that together with like a, a nice uh, cryptographic structure, data structure, so that you just uh, uh, sign this structure, and then you can uh, authenticate all the different messages here. Uh, yeah, and just because uh, we, we are on a, on a public release schedule with the internet computer. So uh, we had uh, delivered the, the first uh, uh, 
piece of, of the internet computer was uh, like last year, a year ago, which was really just the SDK and then our Motoko language. Then in uh, Davos, uh, what we called BROS, it was like a, a demo network, so, so we showed the first applications. Uh, then earlier this year in, in uh, July, uh, we had the, the first couple of developers on the network. So that we had a, like a live network that was running and so developers uh, that could test it. Um, we were still like shutting down the, the network like all, all the summers, uh, like almost every day if, in order to build up, uh, you know, have new features to fix bugs and so on. And actually tomorrow we'll be releasing the, the Sodium uh, version. Uh, so from, from now on, um, it's sort of uh, built in the, what we call the, the network neural system, which is the distributed governance and, and some economics. So uh, the economics mean that the resources are paid for uh, you know, by, by the usage of the, of the re resources. It's, it's different from like a model like Amazon where, where you just pay for, for some hardware. On the internet computer, you actually only pay uh, uh, for what you need and, and, and you pay as, as you go. It's, it's, uh, you don't have like this uh, um, sort of inflexible models like, like you have in, in, the, in the current IT stack. And here's also, also the link. I mean, again, so that, that's, uh, uh, the link is also found on, the, uh, on our uh, website. And uh, in a, I guess, we're just in a few weeks, uh, we have our, our Mercury launch will be uh, the public network. So where, where everybody can uh, just onboard and, and uh, develop uh, and run software on the internet computer. So, so for now, if you're interested in, in doing that, uh, you, you uh, of course can also do that, but we sort of have an onboarding process where we help you to, uh, uh, with the first steps to, towards uh, applying software on the internet computer. Uh, yeah, so I guess uh, as I said already, you can just uh, reach out and you can build on, on this uh, new software stack that makes it much easier to develop software. Thanks a lot uh, for your uh, uh, attention and I'm, I'm very happy to take a few questions if there are some questions. Tell us more about the internet computer. Um, it's probably one of the best funded startups out there and already in the unicorn status. Uh, for me, it was actually quite interesting to have this uh, review on the cryptographic achievements. And uh, it's always funny to see that uh, people talk about last year was a big, big thing in the blockchain world, multi-party computation. And then I learned here that it's from 1986, so it's not that new. Um, this is always interesting to see. And eCash was around before. Uh, Bitcoin was around. Anyway, um, we have time for questions. I'm going to come, come with the microphone to you. If you have questions, just raise your hand. Uh, Question, how do you protect against deploying Mother? Mother. Uh, yes, so uh, well, of course, uh, anybody can deploy any canister uh, what, what, what they want on top of the internet uh, computer. So these canisters could, of course, also be uh, like malicious. And so, yes, we, we have to protect uh, against that. And then, of course, there's, I mean, as these are all web assemblies, so we're using isolation, uh, virtualization uh, technology to, to isolate the different canisters. They're also ran in, in different processes. So, like, all, all of the state of the art uh, isolation technology is used in order to protect uh, against this kind of malware. Any other questions? Um, see the canisters. Is the software moving between data centers for geo redundancy, or have you done something around that? I guess I didn't understand. Uh, I hadn't understood that the question all in detail. So you, you, the question was what, what we do for geo redundancy with the canisters. So um, two hundred by X jurisdictions, or what do you do? Mm, okay. Yeah, so I guess. The, we will have some, some of that. We will have uh, different, uh, I guess we call them subnets, uh, different subnetworks that, that uh, can host uh, particular canisters. And, and the, actually the idea is uh, to differentiate them across a number of um, uh, ways. So, so first of all, it could, it could also be, you know, storage networks where uh, you, you, the data that you store there are authenticated already. And, and then of course, you don't need a lot of replication. So for storage, maybe replication factor four or, or six might, might be enough. 
Um, for financial transactions, uh, you probably want to have a much higher replication factor, something like uh, you know, 28 uh, or, or even higher. Uh, for the network neural system, the governance system, we have like a replication factor of uh, maybe something like 150, so it has to be really, really secure. So that, that's what one, you know, the security. We'll have uh, um, some machines that are also provide prices so that actually the, even the data centers cannot look at the data because normally the internet computer is, is a protocol, so it's like an open protocol. So if it, unless it's in, encrypted, then of course you would see all the data. And so we'll also have like uh, subnets that, that you use uh, encryption to protect all the data. And then for, for, uh, for legislation, also we, we can have uh, uh, networks that uh, uh, have data centers in some uh, in, in some regions, some uh, legislation uh, uh, regions, and, and not in others. So we'll, we'll also differentiate against that. Uh, but of course, I mean, the, the, it is a big open question how, how to deal with uh, the different legislation in the different countries uh, because <laughs> like the distribution really makes it harder, right? Whether or not, if you just uh, put your software on a single data center, you know that this data center is in one country and that that's the only uh, way you have to deal with it. Now, if you replicate it, you do run it in, in many different countries potentially, you do run it in many different le legislations and also for, for, for privacy point of view, you, you, you know, in the first step you, you make it harder, right? Because now you have more data in, in different places. So. But uh, if, at least for the privacy, crypto can, can help. You, you can encrypt all of these data. Uh, for the legislation, uh, like, uh, we just have to, uh, well, for, for now, deal with that. And I think in the future, if we encrypt it, uh, then actually the legislation shouldn't really matter because the data is secure. It, it lives uh, securely on the internet computer. And I think in, in this area, we'll, we'll have to see how the legislation changes and adapts uh, to technology. And it is, it's all a bit always like that, right? I mean, the, the new technology comes, it does something that leg legislation hasn't really seen coming, that they don't really know how to deal with that. And then uh, some of these things just have to have to change and uh, adopt how technology can now do, deal differently with things than how it did uh, deal before. Okay, thank you, Jan. Um, we have time for one final question. Yeah, um, what's the plan on onboarding third-party data centers and how would the incentivization Look like for them to participate in the network. Yes, yeah, so, so uh, I mean, the 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 goal is of course to have only third party data centers in, in that sense, right? I mean, uh, uh, of course they, they have to satisfy themselves some minimal requirements in, in terms of the capacity, the computational powers they have to provide. So we 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 do have like a, a hardware spec that, that uh, data centers have to fulfill. Uh, but other than that, it, it's really by, by, by the governance system, right? I mean, the, the governance system or the network will put out a proposal or, or a call for data centers to join uh, with some capacity, some, you know, like uh, geographically, uh, geography where, where it should be. And then, then the data center sort of can apply for that. And then the, the governance system will, will see an application of data center, maybe see the, the you know, like the public keys of the data center, maybe the KYC of the data centers, and then they, they can vote on uh, the, the, that data center to join, and then, uh, uh, th then all the rest is taken care of the protocol, right? I mean, the, then the protocol says, okay, here, here's a new data center, that's the public key of the data center, and then based on that, the data center can, can join this node, can join the, the protocol, and uh, it just will, will, will run. Uh, together with the rest of the system. Okay, thank you very much, Jan. Um, I, I would have much more questions that also goes into economics, you know, and, and how can I participate? Where, uh, where, where is this run in the end, you know, because we have some uh, legal restrictions at this time, uh, even though it's encrypted. And uh, well, also I will be interested in the marketplace, but I guess tomorrow, tomorrow we're gonna hear much more in your launch event, so. And I guess people also can contact you if they have questions directly from, from the conference here. Well, it was my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Uh, have a good conference and, and a good day. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.